with us on the Jimbo Hannon Show at one 866 jimbo one 505 4626 Recall our past discussions about net neutrality. That's the principle that Internet service providers and governments should treat all data on the Internet the same, not uh, discriminating or charging more or less based on uh, user, content, site, platform, application, or type of equipment used. The Obama administration, through the FCC, wrote rules that would enforce net neutrality by regulating the Internet, much like a utility akin to power companies or water companies. Everybody would pay for what they use, no more and no less. Critics argue that the regulations would stifle innovation and cause a slowdown in rolling out broadband service to everyone. So, that uh, is going to head to court now, and a three-judge panel will rule on the case, U.S. Telecom Association versus FCC, later this week. Let's talk about just what's at stake here with... Uh, uh, Lawrence Spywack of the nonprofit Phoenix Center for Advanced Legal and Economic Public Policy Studies online at phoenix-center.org. Thanks for being with us, Lawrence. Oh, thank you so much, Jim. It's great to be back. Absolutely. So, uh, first of all, uh, please amplify on and or correct my summary of what's at stake in this uh, federal appeals court uh, decision. Uh, well, it was a very good summary. Um, just to elucidate a little bit more on that, this is a, a really, really big case, and it raises a tremendous amount of legal issues uh, that comes up, primarily because, just by way of a bit of background, this this case is now in its third iteration before uh, at least one of the judge, Judge Tatel, is on the D.C. Circuit. And at the heart of the problem here is finding a legal regime that has a light touch yet can provide adequate safeguards against bad acts on the internet. And that was originally what the whole net neutrality was supposed to be. The problem is, is that the debate becoming so politicized turned from trying to find a, a, a scalpel, if you will, again, to protect against anti-competitive harms to out and out regulation. And so it really is with the current iteration is, is the best way is, you know, trying to shoot a gnat with an elephant gun. And so just by way of background, and pardon me for getting a little bit technical, but it's, it's extremely complicated. I'll try to simplify it as best I can. The original, to understand the debate, the core issue of the debate is whether or not the Internet should have a light touch under what's called Title I or is regulated on like the old Ma, Ma Bell monopoly was as what they call a common carrier uh, telecommunication service under Title II of the Communications Act of 1934. So we're talking old, old, old regulations. And, and when it far predated uh, many of the issues that have arisen in uh, the 21st century. Absolutely. I mean, nobody, nobody even envisioned the Internet in 1934. Oh, absolutely. And I can tell you, because I was at the FCC in the 90s, we didn't, couldn't even visualize um, the mobile industry, much less having two wireline networks, to give you an idea <laughs> where we're at with this. <laughs> well, I mean, the, the, we really, I guess to a certain extent here, are talking about a, a problem that's been with us now for several decades and will only get worse as the uh, uh, rapid proliferation of new technology develops, and that is that there's always been a problem in, in at least the 20th century of technology outpacing regulation and or the lack thereof. In other words, government not keeping up with the scientists and the engineers. As the pace of new technology uh, it leaps forward uh, uh, exponentially, uh, government still plods along at the same old pace, so we are, are, uh, are we not uh, facing the same problem multiplied many times over now that government just does not seem to, to be able, with the, the plodding pace of, of government, and the uh, stuck in the in the uh, the past uh, uh, bureaucratic mindset, it doesn't seem to be really capable of providing that kind of uh, of scalpel to which you referred. It's either either uh, the wild wild west or that elephant gun you talked about. Well, here's the irony, Jim: is that the FCC, believe it or not, or at least prior administrations of the FCC, always believe with nascent technologies that they want to encourage them. To, you know, the disruptive technology. So they always applied what we call a light touch. And that's exactly what they did with the Internet. And that's exactly what they did with broadband. They said, you know, when the Internet came around in the 90s, we don't want to apply those legacy old telephone regulations. So they applied 
they reclassified broadband as what's called a Title I information service. So it was still under the jurisdiction of the FCC, but it was a light touch. And that light touch is what spurred all this investment because capital flows where you get the greatest return. And we've seen the benefits of that. We've seen mobile broadband. We've seen terrestrial broadband. It's just been fantastic with the light touch. But there have been cries about, oh, no, we, we, we don't have the adequate protection. So it's always been this struggle about how to create to, to craft a legal regime that works. So what happened was, making a very long and complicated story uh, short, the FCC, the last big time they wrote net neutrality rules was in 2010. And they kept the Internet as a Title I service. They were thinking about reclassifying using the old telephone rules, but they said, no, that's really a step too far. Let's keep it as a Title I service. But they imposed rules that included... Uh, no blocking and no, uh, no what they call no undue discrimination and a transparency rule. What's interesting about that set of rules, you know, the old expression: you may not get what you need, you get what you want, but you get what you need. Everybody in the industry had signed off on the deal because they realized it was good to have a set of clear rules. They weren't obtrusive. The companies felt they could run their business. However, one company, Verizon, decided they were going to appeal. And the problem is, is that when it got up to the D.C. Circuit, which is where the case is coming back this week, what the judge said, he goes, look, you know, the slight touch is fine. But the problem here is that by imposing this undue discrimination rule and this no blocking rule, you're essentially forcing people to uh, carriers to charge a price of zero. So you're really imposing de facto price regulation. And what the court said is, look. We realize that you've classified them as a Title I service, but you're really doing is treating them like a Title II common carrier service. So you can't have it both ways. So here is a roadmap. Courts, like most institutions, you know, don't like to see the same thing coming back over and again. So if you, you know, D.C. Circuit decisions, even the Supreme Court does this, they'll give a roadmap to follow. So this time they won't, when it, you know, when it won't come back. So the the court, the D.C. Circuit, in the case called Verizon v. FCC, gave the FCC a roadmap on how to write legally sustainable net neutrality rules without reclassifying. What's interesting here, and they issued a notice of proposed rulemaking in May 2014, is that the FCC followed the court's instructions. And everybody... <laughs> that's, that, that's the interesting part, that they actually did what they were ordered to do. Yeah, you know, they picked up. And every communications lawyer in town is going, okay, you know, you can argue over the, you know, the little political things that were put in there. But, you know, legally, yeah. they, they did a really very good job of threading the needle. Yeah. Okay, All but, right. you know, the best laid plans of mice and men, and well, that was leaked, and then the left just went ballistic. And then what ended up happening was, is that the Obama administration saw political gold in this, and they got involved. And, you know, when I was coming up, administrative agencies were supposed to be seen and not heard, right? You know, if, if the West Wing is hearing about an obscure agency, they were not happy. This was the exact reverse. Here you had the President of the United States making a YouTube video. And by the way, not filing anything substantive at the FCC, like here's a legal analysis how I would do it, or having one of his, you know, the division's executive branch. He just encouraged all of this, what, what the phrase is, clicktivism. Just literally millions of people filing one-page email comments going, I don't like this rule. <laughs> you know, the, 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 you know the, the chairman of the FCC going, well, look, I got 10 million comments. It must be the way to the evidence. That's not a legal argument, but that's well, what he did. Well, it certainly isn't a legal argument. <laughs> but that's what he did. And all of a sudden, they reclassified in the face of this huge political pressure, started with the White House. And, you know, you have this integrity of the of the independence of the agency, which is supposed to be, which is really a creature of Congress. It's not part of the executive branch. So what happens, what the FCC did, and this is now what's what's going to go on appeal, is that they reclassified, which was the proverbial nuclear option. The Internet is now regulated like a telephone service. Um, but then they engage in all this, what they call forbearance, say, well, we'll, we'll not apply this, we'll not apply this at this time. Uh, which means they're reserving well, Which this. means that nobody can do any planning whatsoever. Absolutely. Uh, we're going to take a quick break and come back with more as uh, we uh, talk tonight with uh, Lawrence Spywack. Again, he's with the uh, nonprofit Phoenix Center for Advanced Legal and Economic Public Policy Studies. Uh, easier just to find the uh, website, phoenix-center.org. 
one 866 jimbo is our number, one 866 What are they going to do to our Internet? Back in a moment. We're talking about what's going to happen uh, regarding uh, the Internet in a court ruling, which I suppose it's a given that whoever loses uh, appeals to the Supreme Court, so I guess this really settles nothing. Lawrence Spywack, our guest, is at phoenix-center.org, the Phoenix Center for Advanced Legal and Economic Public Policy Studies. When is this ruling to come down? Uh, we're not quite sure. Oral arguments are scheduled on Friday. What's interesting is that the court decided that, and that they would take it on an expedited basis, so that is a very welcome sign. So the general consensus is probably early first quarter next year. All right, but there's a, there's a decision that's coming down this week, right? No, the actual oral arguments are scheduled this oh, week. The oral arguments are scheduled. The oral this arguments. Week. So the briefing so there, schedule there will not be there will not be a ruling this week. Just the oral no. arguments. No, just the oral oh, arguments. Okay. But this is a very big deal. It's it's two hours of oral arguments. Um, like you said, there's a huge amount of briefs that are filed. We actually follow a friend of the court brief, and it, it's it's a very big case. And you're absolutely right. It, it will go to the Supreme Court either way. Yeah. Um, the, this day and age finds courts to be rather predictable. That is to say, courts uh, no longer act as uh, society's umpires, calling the balls and the strikes. So this is permissible, that is not permissible. But uh, very much, uh, courts love to treat themselves uh, as uh, uh, non-elected, lifetime tenured legislators. Which is to say, they become predictable on some issues, given the uh, the the past rulings from this uh, D.C. Circuit Court of Appeals, uh, would it be safe to say that there is a strong likelihood that they will come down in favor of cramping uh, innovation on the Internet? Well, what's interesting about this case is that there's actually been three major cases prior to this decision. Uh, One is what's called Comcast v. FCC. The second case is called Selco, forgot the thing is versus FCC or Verizon, which was what's known as the data roaming case, which is a little more technical. And then you had the case I alluded to before the break, which is Verizon v. FCC. Interestingly, they're all written by the same judge, Judge Tatel. Judge Tatel is on this panel. So Judge Tatel has really been the person who has authored the primary jurisprudence on this entire topic, which is which is a very important insight. And, you know, nobody knows how a judge is going to rule. And again, there, there are so many legal arguments that are involved here. Um, but we do know this, and this is the point that a lot of people have been asking me about. I mean, as I, I mentioned before the break, the FCC, Judge Tatel in Verizon gave the FCC a very clear directive. The FCC appeared to do it, then basically just spit in the judge's face and said, no, we're not going to do that. How the judge reacts to that, I don't know, but I can't imagine that it's favorable. Uh, There's also a couple of other issues legal involved because the issue of reclassification actually already went up to the Supreme Court in a case called Brand X. So the commission is, the FCC is now in a position of going, uh, we realize that we stuck our neck out and the Supreme Court, you know, stuck its neck out and, and approved what we did by declaring broadband to be an information service. Oops, now we're changing our mind. Now, agencies are allowed to change their mind, but courts tend not to view that favorably. You know, the, the bottom line of it, what's important to recognize in this case is that the line I like to use is that the FCC, to get its results-driven political outcome, engaged in more legal gymnastics than the Cirque du Soleil show on the Vegas Strip. one eight six six five zero jimbo our number. We'll be back with more in just a moment. Talk with Lawrence Spywack. He's president of the Phoenix Center for Advanced Legal and Economic Public Policy Studies. Now then, looking at uh, the, the type of, uh, of ruling that, that could come out here, uh, are opponents uh, engaging in hyperbole when they talk about all of this stifling of innovation? I mean, there's, there's still a lot of money to be made on the Internet, regardless of uh, the amount of regulations, is there not? Well, yeah, but... Th- the innovation is a bit, a bit of a shibboleth, but yes, I mean, there, there, there can be no doubt that this heavy hand of regulation, I mean, we just had our annual telecom symposium today, and we had a bunch of Wall Street people. I mean, there is no doubt that the regulatory climate is very hostile to investment, and there's no doubt that the current regulatory climate is hostile to innovation. Uh, one of the offshoots of this net neutrality order is the fact that you now have the FCC looking into privacy. 
And so now you have a dual privacy regime where you have what's called edge providers, Google, Facebook, et cetera. They're all handled on a post hoc basis at the Federal Trade Commission. Yet the FCC is about to regulate all the edge providers and not allow them to deal in terms of uh, with with uh, data collection. So you have this asymmetrical privacy. So that's essentially, for example, what that's going to result in is taking profits from the core and transferring it to the edge. And you, if something is less profitable, you're going to put less money into it. So without question, this is a very hostile regulatory environment. And uh, that's that's a very big issue at hand. Absolutely. It, it, it's you know what people sometimes refer to as mother may I. If I want to innovate, I've got to go to the government first and say, can I do this? And if they like you, they'll go, yes. And if they don't, no. It, it seems almost like part of the overall pattern of this administration. Uh, when in doubt, put things through the Department of Motor Vehicles. Right. Yep. Wonderful. That- well, fair enough. All right. Uh, are there other major issues uh, coming up in regard to uh, to this general topic? Not necessarily maybe net neutrality per se, treatment of the Internet, but but uh, the uh, overarching theme here of uh, when in doubt, government uh, intervention is the best way to go. Any any more cases involving that sort of thing? Well, if you remember the first time I came to visit you, I think it was last year, we talked about municipal broadband. Uh, since yeah. then, the FCC has, uh, in my view, really exceeded its jurisdiction. It has, in, in direct contravention of Supreme Court precedent, it has used a, a very convoluted legal theory to preempt state laws that are designed to uh, limit uh, or restrict uh, municipal broadband, which are designed to protect taxpayers from being on the hook. And uh, that's also that's now going to be argued in front of the Sixth Circuit relatively soon. So there's a lot of these issues that are coming up, and that's just at the FCC, about you know the fundamental issue of do I want to put money and do I want to innovate in the business? Because you know there's innovation in so many different places. There's at the edge, at the core, but... If you don't have a healthy ecosystem, you know, if I kind of joke and refer to the tree of life, all this Internet stuff goes away. You know, your yeah. iPhone goes down. That's a problem. But if you don't have a network, you're really in trouble. Yeah. And I think well, that's now, when a we look at this. When you look at this overall uh, the overall question here, they mean, uh, despite what they may think at the FCC and the other alphabet soup agencies, they are not omnipotent, answerable to uh, to no uh, federal, state, or local authorities. In point of fact, I would think that at some point, ignoring the Supreme Court could get you in trouble. At another point, I know for a fact that it is certainly within the power of a Republican Congress, for example, to tell the FCC chairman if they want so much as a penny to buy paper clips, they will do this, 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 or this. They have the power to withhold money. Why are, are the other branches of government just standing by with uh, their thumb in a most uncomfortable place, uh, basically allowing the FCC and other such agencies to do what the hell they want to? Why aren't they being jerked by the neck until they come around? That's an excellent question, Jim. Um, <laughs> you have to ask the leaders of Congress. But, you know, we, we work, uh, live in a, a system of government with, with, uh, with you know, co-equal branches of government, and it's divided. Yeah, co-equal, as in, as in they have some authority here. Um, and, and that's why, you know, politics very often is a game of chicken. And, you know, we've seen the issues about in terms of the government shutdown. I mean, you know, we did a paper a couple of years ago, really big empirical paper. It was, it was cited by the Speaker of the House in terms of, we called it the cost per regulator, and then we found that each federal regulator costs about was it seventy private sector jobs? I forgot off the top of my head, because what we realize is it's, it's very simple theory that you know the more money and resources you have, the more you have the ability to go off and sort of run amok. So the theory, of the paper, and the empirics sort of prove it is that you know with a smaller budget, you're forced to be more targeted in your approach. And that's part of it. And hopefully we can see Congress doing something about that. They're trying to hold better oversight hearings. Um, Charles Krauthammer did an actually an interesting piece last month. Why the well, we, we don't have time to go into yeah. the entire Krauthammer piece at this uh, juncture. Suffice it to say, in, in summation, that Republicans have controlled the House since 2010 and the Senate since 2014. And, well, question mark, question mark, stay on the line. We'll speak off air. Lawrence Spywack is president at Phoenix hyphen center dot org. I'm Jim Bohannon and this is Westwood One.